All right, everybody, thanks for attending. Uh, this is the preferred cold weather fuel oil system design webinar. And uh, we're doing this because of the unprecedented cold weather we had in the south uh, during two weeks in February. Um, um, I had to help get a bunch of boiler customers online on oil and did some tech support helping customers uh, get their fuel handling systems going. So we thought we would talk about how to design your uh, fuel handling system for cold weather. I am joined by Alex Canny. Alex is a sales engineer in the Northeast. He hails from Maine and currently, uh, you live in New Hampshire now, right? Uh, but you cover the whole Northeast? That's right, yes. Okay, so that's Alex Canny and I'm David Oaf. Uh, my background is boilers and I've been doing fuel system design and commissioning since um, since I joined Preferred about 15 years ago. Alex, when was the last time you actually did uh, fuel oil service work? Uh, two days ago. Two days ago, okay. That's probably the longest it's been in a while. Okay, and uh, I was asked to plug our uh, fuel oil systems demystified. This is an 11 by 17 uh, laminated thing that we print that you can put up in your cubicle, and it's full of all kinds of useful information about how to design a fuel handling system for uh, emergency diesel generators or uh, dual fuel boilers. And if you would like one uh, shipped to you or you want a box of them shipped to you so you can pass them out to your coworkers, email Michael Sipes. His email address is on the screen here now. Okay, and uh, plugging our next webinar, um, it's gonna be March 18th. This is Renewable Solutions for the Boiler Room, where we're going to talk about how to reduce the carbon footprint of your boiler room. How to participate. Uh, you go to webinar, Open and hide your control panel. Join audio by choosing uh, computer audio to use voice over internet protocol, and then type your questions into the chat box. Um, Michael, if you see a question that's pertinent to to the topic or the slide that we're still on, go ahead and cut in, and we'll uh, we'll kind of pause the action to take a question. Otherwise, we will uh, we'll field everybody's questions at the end of this presentation, and we plan to go an hour. But we've got you know, we got about 30 slides, and they're they're pretty meaty slides, so we might go a little bit over an hour. So uh, we'll see how that goes. All right, we already met the presenters. Uh, this is the agenda: cold weather design cold weather retrofit and emergency responses. And then we'll wrap it up with a little closing and questions and then uh, diving right in. So uh, we're talking about diesel fuel, uh, specifically ultra low sulfur diesel fuel. And uh, it was, uh, Rudolph Diesel did not invent diesel fuel. Diesel fuel was around when, uh, when he was around inventing what Rudolph Diesel did design and get the patent for was the diesel engine. And uh, there's a lot of pictures of Rudolph Diesel on the internet, but uh, I like this one because he's, he's got the, the cool handlebar mustache in this picture. Um, ASTM D975 is the standard for diesel fuel oils. It covers seven different grades of fuel oil. And um, nowadays, ultra low sulfur diesel can contain up to 5% biodiesel now. So B5 uh, without disclosure. So uh, there can be up to 5% biodiesel now in diesel, and you wouldn't even know about it. And that's going to become important uh, for reasons that we'll explain uh, in upcoming slides. Alex, give me a mic check. I haven't heard from you. Yeah, I'm right here. Okay, good. I'm just admiring the mustache. I'm going to have to try and grow a mustache like that. You don't see it very often anymore. 
Okay, so uh, two important terms when you're talking about diesel fuel and uh, and temperature is the cloud point. Cloud point is the temperature at which the waxes or paraffins in the oil begin to separate when oil is chilled to a low temperature. It's around 14 degrees F for number two ultra low sulfur diesel. Uh, cold filter plugging point is another term they use for, uh, to describe diesel properties. And this is used to determine the low temperature operability of diesel fuel. And I found a couple of cool pictures on the internet of a totally gelled up uh, fuel filter. And uh, I'm not sure what that is in the top picture. It looks like a sump maybe. Yeah. And this, so when we're talking about filters themselves, this is generally going to be on engines, correct? Yeah. 90% um, of this presentation uh, is about engines. Um, the the oil needs to be above the, the cloud point to pump. If these paraffins start dropping out, they're going to plug up strainers and plug up pumps. So uh, that part of it's applicable to, to boilers as well. So there's a new phenomenon with ultra low sulfur diesel fuel called wax dropout. This occurs when ultra low sulfur diesel is given a cold soak of 48 to 72 hours, which causes large wax crystals to form and sink to the bottom of the tanks. Uh, these tanks, these crystals are not readily dispersed in the fuel when the temperature is elevated, uh, which is a scary thought. And it was first noticed during a cold front in the Northeast in 2007, uh, right after people switched to ultra low sulfur diesel, there was a particularly nasty cold front uh, in the Northeast and everybody's oil started to gel up. And what they found was, you know, you couldn't pump it once it became gelled. And even once the oil was warmed back up again, these wax crystals wouldn't dissolve back into the fuel. So they had to be removed or, or the oil was unusable. And this was a, a new phenomenon to ultra low sulfur diesel that didn't happen with low sulfur diesel. Uh, low sulfur diesel had a sulfur content of 500 parts per million or less, and ultra low sulfur diesel, I think, is 15 parts per million or less. Do we know if there's any effect to the actual efficiency of the engines once the that wax had dropped out? It seems like the BTU content of the fuel would be quite a bit lower. That's a good question. I don't know, but uh, it does seem like there'd be a lot of BTUs in that wax. Right. Okay, so ice formation in ultra low sulfur diesel. So ultra low sulfur diesel at 30 degrees F can only hold 35% of the water it holds at 75 degrees F. So what that means is if you've got ultra low sulfur diesel in a tank at 75 degrees F and you get a cold front and it cools down to 30 degrees F, 65% of the water that was in that fuel is gonna get pushed out in the form of little droplets. When the fuel gets below 32 degrees, the droplets freeze and they start to agglomerate, which I think is a word. It means it means that these crystals get bigger and bigger. And the ice crystals in fuel can look like wax particles and plug strainers. And uh, during this cold front, uh, it hit on like a Friday and I started to get calls from customers on Sunday saying that their oil had gelled, which which seemed really early you know, for fuel to get down to 14 degrees. But uh, what they may have had was water in their fuel that that froze at 32 degrees and started to plug their strainers. And uh, they say to the uninitiated, um, these water molecules, these ice molecules in the fuel can look like wax. And they have the same effect of plugging strainers and, and plugging up pumps. The other problem with water is that water sits at the bottom of the fuel tank where your suction lines are. So if the water at the bottom of the tank freezes, your suction lines could be frozen, and then you're not gonna move any oil. Yeah, it can also affect sensors too. We've seen cases where if you have a sensor that uh, has access to the bottom of the tank, or even interstitial sensors, um, freezing can, can mess with a lot of those things. You get a lot of uh, false alarms during an event like that. So, so where you're at, Alex, um, how often is it below 32 degrees in the winter? Uh, that's pretty much winter. 
so pretty much all the time. Yeah. Um, it got down, uh, we're going to show a slide that, that had the Dallas weather. They say it got down to three in the slides I'm going to present. Um, I think DFW actually got down to minus two. How often does it get to minus two uh, up there in the northeast? Uh, it depends on how close to the coast you are. Um, it's going to be a little more temperate. But yeah, in northern New England, that's not an unusual thing. We're talking multiple times a year. It's not something. Okay, and, you, and you have customers with diesel tanks and diesel generators. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of considerations that are taken, usually from the start on most designs, whether it's you know placement, any sort of thing. Okay. So there's really three strategies to uh, for cold weather diesel performance, and the rest of this presentation is really going to talk about these three strategies. Uh, the first strategy is keeping your diesel fuel warm or above the cloud point so that it can pump and it can go through strainers. The second is lowering the cloud point with winter blends or additives, and the third is keeping the water out of the fuel. Everything else we're going to talk about uh, in this presentation is, is really about these three main points. So a little bit of orientation. This is, uh, this is a slide that Alex provided of a fuel system in his territory. Do you want to walk us through this, Alex? Sure. So this is what maybe I would call a legacy system or a traditional system. Um, and I like to start here because not everybody is working on these systems every day and they take many different forms now, but I think it's helpful to walk through what a system like this would have been for, for most of, um, most of uh, designs that we see out in the field. So in this case, starting at the lower left, we have a direct buried tank uh, with some access to grade there. It's outside the building envelope. And then if we follow the fuel lines into the building, the first unit that we have there is a duplex supply pump. Uh, this is traditionally going to be where most of the controls are located. Uh, we have two supply pumps. Um, and then if we move to the right of that, we also have a filtration skid. And this is kind of a, um, I wouldn't say overbuilt, but it depends on what the facility is. Not every facility may need something this um, extensive, but it does show all of the options as far as water holding tanks, chemical injection, things like that. And this pertains to what we're going to talk about in that third point, which is um, keeping water out of the system and removing water that's made its way into the system. And, and that's then, also called a fuel polisher to a lot of people, right? Yeah, I, I actually prefer the, the term polishing because filtration really, I think, shortchanges what that skid is all about. Um, as far as microbial growth, sludge, uh, performance of the system, um, we're going to see that water plays a huge role in all of that. And so it's not just about filtering out a certain uh, micron, a particulate. It's about also coalescing the water that may be suspended in the fuel itself and then bringing that out in the liquid phase so that it can be disposed of. Um, and that, in my opinion, that's its most important job. There On the generator, you're going to have a filter that brings uh, particulate out down to spec. Um, but you know this job, I think, is much more than just filtration. So as we follow the fuel up from the transfer pump, which is in the center there, we go to our standalone day tank, which directly serves the emergency generator. Um, a lot of systems here in the Northeast are set up like this. There are some major differences that people will observe. Uh, the bulk storage tank or the main tank that's outside the building envelope, a lot of times that will be above ground. And we're gonna get into uh, how placement affects a lot of these things. Um, it may also be within the building envelope. We're gonna take a look at uh, why one way may be preferred over another. You okay, and usually when we're talking about fuel polishing, uh, we say that the the biggest reason to polish your fuel is to get the water out because the water is is where the microbes live and that's what starts the whole corrosion cycle. But uh, when you're talking about freeze protection for a diesel system, um, it's kind of dual purpose. You know, you need to get the water out of the out of the oil for freeze protection too because it drops out at 32 degrees, whereas your oil is probably good to about 14 depending on the blend. Yeah, and that's the nice thing about uh, a lot of the considerations that we're going to look at today. They're not just uh, to prevent problems in cold operation. They're going to give you benefits all year round at every temperature range. Okay, so this is basically the same. Uh, this is basically the same diagram that Alex just showed you, but more, in more of a PNID or a schematic type of form. We've got an underground main tank going to a duplex pump set going to a day tank, and then the uh, the engine is fed out of the day tank, and the engine has its own little pump that's actually inside the engine, 
I, I show it outside because it's important when we're designing the fuel system and understand that there's a little fuel pump there. And then the, uh, the engine, that pump uh, will pump three to four times the uh, consumption of the engine. And the oil that it doesn't use is used to cool the engine and is returned back to the day tank um, a little bit warmer. And then if you start to overfill that day tank, uh, you can either gravity return or we can put a return pump there and we'll, we'll pump oil out of the day tank and back to the main underground tank. This slide is, is basically the same thing, but with an above ground tank. And the only real difference here is that uh, we'll put an anti-siphon valve in the line and the suction line so that we don't uh, siphon oil out of the tank when the pumps aren't running. And we're gonna have a, uh, we're gonna have relief lines that go back to the main tank. And at the day tanks, um, we can't use gravity with, a, with an above ground tank. So we're gonna have return pumps on the day tanks to uh, return oil back to the main storage tank. And that's, that's important for circulating oil and also for warming the entire system as you'll see here in a little bit. We see a lot of systems these days, um, I think uh, quite a bit also at like data centers where they have a lot of space around them, where you'll just have a lot of direct fill tanks for generators or gravity fed systems that don't have a transfer pump. I think it's important when designing a system like that to take a look at you know some of the specific calculations and things because while it may work out on paper to have a gravity fed system, if a siphon is lost or something like that, you can really run into problems. So we are mainly talking about in this presentation, a traditional system with transfer pumps and a day tank and things like that. And there's a lot of reasons why. Okay. And this schematic uh, actually shows the, uh, the return pump on the day tank, returning fuel back to the underground storage tanks. So, um, so now that you've seen what a typical schematic looks like, you know, bear this in mind as we talk about uh, the different components that go into the system. So the first design consideration is location, location, location. Uh, when we do a, a typical fuel system design webinar or presentation, we have a slide that talks about the pluses and minuses of above ground tanks versus uh, underground tanks. And like bullet point number seven is that underground tanks are more resistant to extremes of weather. And that's that's really the most important thing when we're talking about uh, designing a system from the start that can withstand cold temperatures is that uh, underground storage tanks provide fantastic insulation. Not only is the tank insulated by the, the dirt that covers it and the dirt that it's sitting in, but the earth also is a huge thermal mass to mitigate temperature fluctuations in the fuel. So when you're, when you're doing the initial design of a new system, one thing to consider is underground tanks are, are really probably the best thing you can do to mitigate problems with cold oil in the winter. And, and the more common problem we have here in Texas is hot oil in the summer. You know, when your tank is buried, you don't have to worry about your oil getting too hot in the summer, and you don't have to worry about your oil getting too cold in the winter. That's the neat thing about this application. I, and I would say, it, we're, I know we're gonna talk in a second about um, tanks you know, located indoors, which would be a close second, but the neat thing about a buried tank is that it, if you were to insulate that tank and you're worried about heat being added during hot weather from return from the generator, so heat being added internally in the fuel system, uh, that buried tank is actually gonna shed heat to that heat sink in the earth, uh, similarly to the advantage in the wintertime. Whereas if you were just to insulate that tank, you may actually make the heat problem a little worse in the summertime. Even though it will prevent heat from coming in, you know, via sunlight and things like that. If it's internal heat coming back from the day tank, then it could be a bigger issue. Unfortunately, it seems like uh, when I talk to most design engineers, the, when do design assist on their fuel system, the, the type of main storage tank and the location of the main storage tank has often already been decided before the job sort of got handed off to engineers. Do you do you find that to be the case in the Northeast as well? Yes, especially recently, it uh, seems like these decisions are being made kind of above the mechanical level, um, which is unfortunate, I think, because I think the mechanical engineer can really provide a lot of expertise and um, you know, in that decision, uh, it's more than just footprint and space. and 
personally here in the Northeast, I really like indoor tanks um, that are in like a vault or in the basement. But I understand, you know, there's a there's a price on the head of every square foot in that building. So a lot of times that that isn't a possibility. So in this slide, we're really talking about above ground outside the building versus below ground outside the building. Um, obviously, burying a tank, it, the cost actually works out to about the same, but you know, access can sometimes be a challenge. But yeah, a lot of times that's taken out of our hands before we're even involved in a project. So an underground tank itself costs less than an above ground tank. But when you add in all the installation labor, it comes out to be a little bit more money to have a buried tank, correct? Generally speaking, um, for an underground tank uh, here, one of the things that I'm a big fan of is having a hybrid design. Um, and it really comes down to the amount of space you can take up underground and what kind of rating you need. If you need, um, let's say, if you want to worry about a truck going across your lawn at any point in the next 20 or 30 years. Um, I'm a big fan of a steel and FRP hybrid, but a lot of the tanks that you're gonna see for underground applications are just gonna be fiberglass double wall. Uh, keep in mind that you know, with that, there is a, a berry depth requirement uh, and load rating that you may need to worry about. And it's gonna be a little bit bigger footprint because generally they're gonna to have to have some structural rigidity built into them with the ribs that you see on there. Um, and, and the interstitial spacing and things like that. So they do present some unique challenges, um, but yeah, for the most part, it's gonna be a similar cost when it all washes out. Okay, and it seems like when I ask the question of most engineers, you know, why are we doing this type of tank? Uh, the answer is we're doing this type of tank because this is the only type of tank that would fit. And it, it seems like it's it's architectural concerns and space concerns, not not, you know, engineering concerns? Right, right. Yeah, it's kind of a tail wagging the dog in a lot of cases. Um, and even cases where we were able to present equipment that that would fit and solve some problems, unfortunately, I think they just, um, the architect wasn't really interested in, in complicating the project at that point. Okay, so the point of this is, is give more consideration to underground storage tanks. They really are the silver bullet for both um, cold weather fuel oil design and hot weather fuel oil design. Uh, especially in places like like the south where we can have both and then the uh, your piping can be underground piping or it can be above ground piping um, so if you have an underground tank uh, your piping can come right out of the tank and be above ground or you can run your piping below ground and really the above ground piping is probably the canary in the coal mine that's that's the first place your oil is going to gel because that's where you have this most the most uh, surface area and and the least amount of oil to resist uh, resist that cold wind. Yeah, so, and I've seen designs even where um, you know they were able to get the valuable space indoors for the bulk storage tank, uh, but had to run the piping out, outside up the side of the building. And you know if I had to choose one or the other, I'd almost rather have the riser inside the building and the tank out. Uh, as much as I like, you know, when we can have the tank inside the basement where it can be inspected and everything and it's it's kept, you know, temperature controlled. Um, when cases where we had that riser outside, it really lost a lot of the advantages of having the tank thermally stable. Okay. Okay, so if you can't bury your tank, like, uh, like Alex is saying, um, consider putting your tanks indoors. Prior to last month, I thought it was pretty dumb to store a flammable liquid like diesel fuel indoors, but um, that's the way it's done in a lot of places in the Northeast, just because there isn't any real estate uh, to put tanks and generators and things uh, outdoors. And uh, we work a lot in New York City. In New York City, there really isn't any outdoors. Everything has to go indoors. So we see um, basement tanks, and we see generators and boilers in the basement, or we'll have basement tanks and the generators are on the roof, or the um, main tanks will be in the basement and the generators will be on, on the second or third floor. So in an all outdoor generator fuel system like, like the one you see in this picture, everything is exposed. You know, this looks like a direct fill system, but the oversized belly tanks, uh, the lines, everything is exposed. I see oil pumps, those are supply pumps on, on top of that uh, frame. Everything's out in the weather. So um, this system is, is not prepared 
for cold or for snow. Yeah, and one of the points here on this slide with the wind chill effect, um, obviously with wind chill, it doesn't affect the, the absolute temperature, but when you have systems that have a high exposure, like the one here in the picture, it can affect how quickly that system, if, if the system is passive, right? It's gonna affect how quickly that becomes a problem. So if you just have a very small cold snap, but it's very windy, that's gonna become a very big cold snap very quickly. But also if we have systems, we're gonna talk about a little later about insulation and heat uh, addition and things like that. When you have a system like this, it really should be insulated first, then looking at heat addition. Because when you're this exposed, any sort of a wind chill um, is just gonna pull every BTU out of here that you try to add. Yeah, and, and wind just increases the uh, wind just increases the heat transfer of the system. You know, right. heat out of the oil and into into the environment. And when uh, we're talking uh, when we're talking sorry to interrupt, but when we're talking about parts of the system that are more susceptible. I agree. the The piping, if it's completely exposed, especially if it's single wall, um, that's boy, that's going to be first to go. But I think a, a blind spot that a lot of people have, even when they're considering the piping, is the sub base tanks. Um, we have generators on roofs where you'll have insulated piping, you'll have everything all the way up the building, but then all of that fuel is sitting in a sub-base or what we call a belly tank under the generator. And if you look at the form factor, you'll have a couple of hundred gallons of fuel maybe in a, a large footprint tank that's eight or 10 inches tall, and it's all steel. Um, and I've had cases where it's the it's the floor to a generator enclosure and the generator enclosure has a heater in it, but it doesn't really do anything, uh, even with an immersion heater, because um, the, all the BTUs are just getting immediately pulled out of that steel shell. It's just a, a big flat heat sink at that point. Um, and I think it's one of the reasons that, you know, for a lot of systems, especially if it's mission critical application, we, we have to take a really hard look at uh, the way we're designing these sub base uh, tanks for generators. So a belly tank is kind of the, the worst of both worlds. It's a lot of surface area and the surface area is steel, so it conducts heat fairly quickly, and and sometimes it's not a lot of volume. I, I've seen belly tanks that were five inches tall. Right. Um, I've also seen belly tanks that are four feet tall and, and hold 5,000 gallons. So obviously the bigger belly tank is gonna resist a, a cold spell better than a, a, a short skinny one. Yeah, I, to a degree. Um, but if you you know if you were to have that in in a form factor that's like a more traditional day tank, just by its nature, um, whether it's inside the generator enclosure or whether it's outside with some sort of insulation, it's going to be much easier to control. And in one case, we had a system where we had insulation, we had heat addition, but because the one weak link was the belly tank, none of it none of it did any good. Yeah, and then a final consideration is, you know, in an emergency, uh, this system may have to be worked on. And uh, this is not a system I would like to work on um, in the middle of a blizzard. You know, imagine all that covered in snow and zero degrees and, and windy. I talked to some technicians a couple of weeks ago that were working outdoors and uh, they were not having a good time of it. A couple of times they said, uh, I'm gonna go back to my truck and warm up for a few minutes. You know, I got this picture off the internet. Somebody's going to recognize this and send me an angry email. <laughs> Won't be the first. Okay, so consider putting more of your fuel system indoors. And here's a picture of a preferred fuel system with uh, two day tanks, uh, two duplex transfer pump sets, and two filtration sets on the left there that are all indoors. So this can all be in a heated space, or even if it's like an unheated uh, unheated facility room, it's still gonna be a lot warmer inside than it is outside. And if there's boilers in this room too, uh, the boilers are gonna keep this whole room warm. In, uh, according to NFPA, you can have up to two 660 gallon day tanks indoors. Uh, more, or I, I should say, more or less, depending on code and your region. Um, I'm working on a system now that's going to have two 800-gallon day tanks indoors that have been approved by the fire marshal. And uh, I say less because in Los Angeles, uh, you're only allowed to have 60-gallon day tanks max. But the point here is uh, your, your day tanks, where your generators are drawing their immediate fuel, 
and your pump sets, your filtration sets, it's, it's all indoors where it can be protected from the weather. Yeah, and, and that's one of the, um, I think one of the more challenging things in designing these systems is that it's so regional and code dependent um, and not even just code, but you know, the local inspector can have a lot of say. Here in New England though, we have, we have systems with uh, very large amounts of fuel stored inside. Um, the large amount of fuel generally needs to be at the lowest level. So if that means at the bottom of the parking garage that's five stories down, that's where it is. Um, and uh, if you're talking fuel at an elevated level, I've had some success in the past working with a local fire department to do things like um, fire rated tanks, UL 2085 uh, can be helpful. Um, so there are ways to increase the amount of fuel stored, especially, and a lot of the, the code and uh, inspectors have in recent times uh, taken to heart the amount of runtime. It's not just, you know, 60 gallons across the board, whether you're a large hospital or a small elementary school, it's, is this life safety? What's the standard? So especially if it's a hospital or something like that, uh, there are a lot more considerations given. Um, David, do you want to uh, take a minute for a question that came in? Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, so we have a question here from, uh, oh, actually from a friend of mine, Eugene Mosier. Hey, Eugene. Uh, glad that you were able to join us. Uh, he's with the VA here in Manchester, New Hampshire. Um, and uh, he has a question for, uh, mentioned the presentation is mainly for engines, right? And uh, we also have some residential application. Uh, what would, uh, what do you see the differences between this and like an industrial plant? Um, and then fuel tanks outside, just running through the question here. Uh, so some people have had issues with condensation on fuel coming in. So if you have a system where the fuel isn't necessarily presenting a problem itself, it's still pumpable, um, but you can get uh, problems with condensation on those cold lines coming in. Um, so any any thoughts on any of that? Yeah, I've got a couple of slides at the end of this that are going to be talking more about boilers. Um, so we're we're gonna have, we're gonna do some some boiler slides at the end. Um, in humid places and in, in places where you can have relatively warm days and cool nights, um, your tanks are going to condense a lot of a lot of water, and that's uh, that's the reason to have a filtration system or a polishing system to remove that water. And if you get into cold weather, uh, we mentioned already that that water that's suspended in the fuel can ice up and clog filters and and cause pumps to foul and quit working or that ice can sit at the bottom of the tank and, and freeze up your suction line. Um, right. Boilers it, it, are a little more resistant to water than generators are. And uh, anybody that has fired oil for, for any length of time, which, what you like to do is when you're, when you're even just thinking about firing oil is you fire up your transfer pumps and you start circulating oil um, all through the system. Because if you do have, uh, that does a couple of things. It gets the oil moving to allow your strainers to work. And if any any rust got into your oil, it'll get caught in the strainer. And then if you do have any water in the system, um, it, it mixes up the water. And boilers really don't care about small amounts of water in the fuel as long as it's it's well mixed. But if the water is not well mixed, if you get slugs of water, it can make for some really um, interesting combustion that nobody wants to be around. Um, right. And and I think, you know, part of that larger question is uh, why would why would you design a tank above ground outdoors here in New England? And I I don't know how it is in other regions, but it seems to me the the progression that I've seen is that designing a system like this is always about trade-offs and competing interests. And so for instance, if we have a system where um, somebody wants their high alarm to be at a very low level, it's probably because they had a spill at some point. Somebody else wants their low alarm very high, they probably ran out of fuel. So we have a lot of facilities now that have these above ground tanks outdoors. And I think part of it is um, a lot of the, the local regions don't want to deal with buried tanks when it comes to like groundwater contamination. Um, there's been some problems in the past where storing fuel below ground, they've run into leak issues uh, and maintenance issues. And if there isn't already space inside the plant, it's really just kind of a no-go to put it inside the building envelope. And I think that's why uh, historically, at least uh, the facilities I'm aware of, um, there's been a tendency to just take these tanks and push them above ground. 
And so you have um, something that we see a lot, which is systems that are around for a very long period of time, which are dealing with new problems. It's certainly easier to get an above ground tank permitted. I have a customer in Austin, Texas, and there are four different uh, authorities that think they have jurisdiction over his underground tank. <laughs> I'm sure that's not unusual for most regions. So we've talked about uh, we've talked about buried tanks and buried lines. We've talked about moving uh, parts of your fuel system indoors. Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about in is insulation. All tanks are double wall now, and uh, the the interstitial area between the outside and and the main tank can either be air or it can be filled with insulation, or it can be filled with lightweight concrete and make a, a ballistic uh, rated tank. But uh, if you fill it with insulation and meet a few more construction requirements, then you have a UL 2085 fire rated tank. And uh, they're made to withstand a, a two hour fire at, at a certain degree. And there's a, there's a great picture on this slide of, of them doing one of these burn tests on a UL 2085 uh, tank. Oh, it says 2000 degree furnace test. But the other uh, the other advantage this gives you is it gives you a little bit of, of insulation to to withstand the cold, and your above ground piping can be insulated as well. But uh, uh, you've really got to think about insulation because its its value is somewhat limited, and uh, we're gonna we're hoping to demonstrate that on the next slide. So it took some searching because. You know, it's easy to find out what the weather's going to be for the last 10 days. It's really hard to find out what the weather was uh, at a point back in time. But I found a website that shows the weather that we had in Dallas in, in February. And the cold front really started um, February 9th. So on February 8th, we were 68 degrees, which is a pretty normal high for us, you know, in the winter. And uh, and the first wave of the cold front came in and we got uh, we had highs in the... 30s for a couple of days and then low and then high 20s for a couple of days and then kind of the second wave hit on uh, Monday February 15th and our high was uh, 10 degrees and then our low Tuesday morning I think Tuesday morning was the bottom in most places around the DFW area and this graph shows three degrees in uh, and DFW officially at the airport it was minus two degrees and then uh, just as quickly as it came in, it left again. And on February 20th, we were 57 degrees. And I remember February 21st was a Sunday. I went for a bike ride in shorts and a t-shirt and it was 74 degrees that day. And there was still a little bit of snow on the ground. But the duration of this cold spell was, was 11 days. Um, insulating a tank and insulating a pipe are not gonna keep your fuel system warm for 11 days. Right. So. Yeah, so go ahead, Alex. Well, I, and I know that um, that your thinking is similar on this. It really comes down to what kind of event are you designing for? If you're designing for a cold night, insulation, it's going to be passive. You don't have to add any energy to it. Um, it's going to help out, help even out, you know, the ups and the downs a little bit. Um, but if we're talking an event like this, really, what what's the difference between five days and ten days to a system that just has insulation? not much if anything it might take it another half a day to come back up to temperature when it warms up so i think it's important to understand the varying levels that you're designing your system for um and and the ways that we do that and so while insulation i think especially if you have a lot of exposed piping and exposed tanks should be a first step because doing insulation it's expensive yeah and and it, and it will it'll protect against the more common events uh, i'm assuming that the the cold day and a half is probably much more common than the event that you had here you know in 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 the north texas area we'll get a cold front and it typically lasts two to three days and then the wind turns from the south again and we're back into the the 50s or 60s and right. and this cold front we had in february was historic you know, they said it was the coldest it had been since the 1800s, and also a an 11 day cold spell is is really really unusual here. Right. So I think pragmatically, insulation is is probably the first place to spend money. Um, but understanding that insulation is not going to keep heat in the system forever, 
And so when you're designing against a more catastrophic event like this, there has to be some way to add BTUs back in that are being lost, even if they're being lost at a slower rate. And this is why, you know, we talked about first about placement uh, location. If you're talking underground or inside the building, you're, uh, you know, you're really not looking at the numbers the same way as long as your building heat is still on. Um, but you're when you're for 11 days, that's right. Well, you're good all winter if, if you're in the Northeast. Exactly, exactly. And I'd like to, uh, while we're talking about placement, just briefly again, um, we have some really great feedback on the uh, chat channel here, uh, courtesy of Michael Sipes. And uh, somebody mentioned that um, they're speaking about the above ground versus below ground. Some of the other challenges to keep in mind is that there are EPA regulations about how long a tank can be underground. Um, and I'm not sure if it's construction dependent, but uh, it could be 20 years or so. Um, so definitely, I mean, we're not saying that there's one solution for everyone in every single case, but um, there are some things to, to take into consideration there and maybe why we see so many above ground tanks in areas that it just doesn't seem to make sense. Yeah, and I wanted to point out on the slide that, you know, hopefully we have a lot of facility people uh, tuned into this. And this cold front we had in the south in February was was the coldest weather we'd had in the 1800s, you know, um, horse and buggy days. So if your plant was not prepared for this kind of cold, um, you weren't alone. Nobody was prepared for this kind of cold. And before I joined Preferred, I worked for a company that sold uh, equipment to electric utility plants in Texas. And you know, virtually, virtually none of the plants are winterized in, in Texas because these kinds of cold weather events are, are so rare. Okay. So talking about the different ways to add heat to your system, um, one way you can do one way you can do is with tank heaters. Um, immersion heaters can be retrofitted uh, to virtually any tank. They can be installed new with a tank. Um, but the thing to bear in mind about a, an immersion heater is it only heats up uh, the oil immediately around the immersion heater. Uh, to be really effective, it needs to be used in conjunction with some sort of circulating pumps to keep that entire system warm. So if you have an immersion heater in a tank and you run your transfer pumps to circulate oil, that can move heat through the whole system. Immersion heaters alone uh, aren't gonna be that effective. Another technology to use is a suction stub heater. Uh, when used with a suction bell, and a suction bell is just a, a container, kind of an open container to uh, to trap oil around the suction line, it keeps the oil around your suction tube warm and pumpable. And it's typically more effective than a tank immersion heater because only the fuel around the suction line is heated. And um, Alex, this is an old number six oil trick, right? Yeah, we uh, I think we used to have an insert for the suction bell that was a steam coil. We have a steam coil as well, but uh, if you don't have steam, that one's not going to do you much good. Yeah, and I think where this comes in, because a suction stub uh, type heater, which is similar to what we're looking at here as well, is so localized that if you're going to be using this on a larger tank or a tank that maybe doesn't have really, really good insulation, um, it might make sense to keep it all local right to the suction stub itself. Uh, an alternative, if you have a medium-sized tank with great insulation, um, rather than doing a suction stub, you can do an immersion heater and do a, a supply and return at maybe different points in the tank to try to get some, some cross flow. Uh, but the nice thing about this is it pretty much guarantees that there's always going to be warm fuel at, uh, at the suction line. And we've seen cases in the past where um, on heavier grades of fuel, but I'm sure that diesel is just as susceptible that, you know, you have a, a, a body of warm fuel in the tank, but the other side of the tank can be almost completely solid. So we always recommend that the suction line and the return line be on opposite sides of the tank to get uh, circulation. And uh, and that's that's true when you're trying to get circulation to move move heat around in your oil tank as well. Yeah, and and this would be uh, an exception to that, but it, it again comes down to what you know what the biggest consideration is. This might be something more where you know it, it's a constant concern. Um, like I said, with designs, you know, it's always competing interests. Okay, so this is a number six oil trick that uh, is very effective with diesel as well, and you end up having a much smaller heater than uh, than usually a big tank immersion heater. 
so less kilowatt usage. So here's a graph of the uh, the different stub heaters that Preferred makes. Uh, this graph comes out of our catalog. Uh, the biggest the biggest that we make is about two and a half kW or three kW, and a two and a half kW stub heater will heat about 48 gallons per hour of oil uh, to a delta T of 40 degrees F. And 48 gallons per hour is quite a bit of oil. That'll supply a generator about a little bigger than 600 kilowatts. And they're available in all sizes. Yeah, and keep in mind, when we're talking about the Delta Ts here, um, whether it's suction stub heaters or uh, my personal choice that's coming up, uh, the thermal pump set, when we're looking at those Delta Ts, a lot of times I think we look at them uh, kind of in a worst case scenario in the sense that Okay, my coldest day that I had was, let's say it's 10 degrees Fahrenheit. What's the delta T from 10 degrees Fahrenheit? Well, it assumes that the fuel got down to that temperature, and it also assumes that you installed that system at the worst part of the, the event. Um, if the system's been there all along, your delta may never get that extreme because it's coming off a night before where the delta was based off a different number. So if the, the heat in the system is being maintained, um, you know, those numbers look a lot better. You're not, you're not coming off that raw delta. So what you're talking about is, is oil in a tank above ground in Texas, um, in the winter might, might still be 60 degrees. And if we get a cold front, the, uh, the stub heater will just maintain that temperature We're we're not talking about starting at 30 and trying to get up to 60. We're talking about just maintaining. Right. Right. And that's obviously based on, you know, certain level of insulation and things like that, but it's it's a little better than sometimes the numbers would lead us to believe. Okay. Um, another technology out, that's available out there is heat tracing. Um, heat tracing is usually combined with, with pipe insulation because otherwise you lose most of your BTUs to the air. Um, it's not gonna add a lot of BTUs to your system, but it does add the BTUs where you need them the most in your above ground uh, piping that's the most exposed to cold temperatures. Yeah, and something I would add to that, um, especially with heat tracing on piping, is that it adds BTUs to where they're needed the most as far as keeping the system operational. Uh, if you get a large run of pipe that's completely plugged with gelled fuel, it's going to be a problem, especially with valves. Uh, but it's not a great way to inject BTUs into the system as a whole. So if you're looking to uh, control or even mitigate temperature at the generator or at the main tank, heat trace on the piping is really not a good way to do that. It's it's not going to have the amount of wattage generally. And um, we have the graphic there on the screen. I'll just say here for the Northeast, for folks that have been involved with projects in the past, typically if we have a system that's designed from the start, uh, with heat trace, it's going to be uh, factory fabricated, or even if it's a UL shop, um, you're going to have your carrier pipe, your supply and return are going to be, uh, let's say, Schedule 40, Schedule 80. Then you'll have a single containment shell, uh, 10 gauge, and the um, continuous leak detection and heat trace will be running conduits just inside that containment shell or just outside the containment shell. And then you're going to have your insulation wrap. Um, it could be mineral wool. Sometimes we even see aerogel, which is uh, pretty high end. And then you're going to have some sort of cladding around that. So if we're talking design from the start, it's actually a, a pretty clean uh, design. We're talking about retrofit, though, uh, for any of these applications. Um, the cost and the uh, unwieldiness, uh, you know, so to speak, can go up trying to retrofit it onto existing piping. But heat tracing is something that can be added to a system at any time. So you can take a look at the 10 day forecast and order some heat tracing cable and in a few minutes, install it on your piping like these guys did with uh, what looks like strapping tape. Yeah, I mean, you're definitely gonna want some insulation. I, I have my doubts as to effectiveness if, if there's any sort of air movement around these, um, how much that's actually soaking into the to the um, the carrier itself, but yeah, I mean that's you know if you can get your hands on it. Yeah, I I got this picture off the internet too, and this is probably just a construction picture. The next step is probably bring out the insulators and cut a bunch of insulation to go over this. So if this is your picture, send me your hate mail, Alex Canny at preferred-mfg.com. <laughs>
Okay, so the next uh, the next next technology we're going to talk about is the preferred thermal pump system. Uh, the thermal pump system combines a uh, low density electric resistance heater with a duplex pump set. The heater is controlled based on both ambient temperature and fuel temperature, and this can be combined with filtration too to remove water and debris. And you may have a system that doesn't have transfer pumps. Uh, we can still do electric heating on a filtration system. And that way we get all the benefits of filtration and removing water and oil heating all in one. And, and Alex, this system, uh, I think it's on the next slide. This system is typically designed for 40 degree fuel temperature rise as well, right? Yeah, I think that's, that's pretty standard for a lot of products like this. Um, and the great thing, the, the reason this is my go-to here in the Northeast when you have um, systems that are, it, it's not if it's going to get cold, it's just, you know, how soon in the season. Um, is that this can quote unquote see any part of your your whole system. If the main tank uh, temperature sensor is saying that, oh, you know what, temperature of my main tank is getting a little low, we have a diverter valve that allows us to just recirculate with the main tank. So now you have a system where, and we would set up the piping as we mentioned before at opposite ends of the tank, where now you're acting like a suction stub heater, except a suction stub heater with a circulator. And if we get a temperature ping off of the day tank or the belly tank of the generator, we're able to change position on that valve and send fuel downstream. And at every time, we're also conditioning the temperature of the fuel in the lines. So it's really kind of a whole system solution from one point. Um, so in conjunction with some good insulation, uh, this is actually a very successful solution, uh, even for retrofit, because you're really looking at one skid. And especially on the main tank side, it can be hard to find any additional fittings to fit something large in there, uh, like a suction stub heater or bell or something along those lines. So uh, this is a, a really good solution. And one of the other things that we offer is feed forward. Um, so if you have a system where you have some good insulation, uh, but it's already really cold outside, we actually put an outdoor air temperature sensor so that we can preempt uh, you know, whether it's the main tank, the day tank, whatever you're concerned about, and go ahead and start circulating with that uh, ahead of time to really maintain that temperature and take advantage of what we talked about earlier, which is not waiting until you get down to that worst case scenario. So using using that heater to just maintain your fuel at a, at a good temperature as the cold front is coming through. Exactly. Yeah, before it becomes a problem. Yeah, and you can see this is a, this is a chart taken from our catalog. Um, we can make a thermal pump up to an LO207. The 207 will run 2,160 gallons per hour of fuel with a 108 kW heater that'll raise that fuel 40 degrees F. That's that's a big pump set and a lot of heat. So if you've got a if you've got a fuel system that was not designed for cold weather at all, above ground storage tanks, above ground lines, outdoor day tanks, outdoor generators. Um, adding adding heat to your existing duplex pump set, this could be the only thing you need, even for historic cold temperatures like what we had uh, in February. You know, 108 kW or adding 40 degrees to, to 2,160 gallons per hour of fuel, that's a lot of heat. I mean, that'll turn over an 8,000-gallon tank in four hours. It is, and I, I think it really just comes down to the the length of the piping runs and the total amount of fuel stored. I think for a, a small to moderate size system, you know, this could be a, a great way to take care of most uh, cold fronts. For larger systems, though, as we've seen, I mean, if you get that piping long enough, um, you know, eventually you will run out of BTUs. So, it, you know, it, it is kind of a case by case basis. I recently quoted, in fact, since since the cold front, I recently quoted a fuel system for a plant that had six generators with big belly tanks that, that were direct fill. And now they're adding two above ground main tanks and they asked me to quote two duplex pump sets, two filtration systems, six return pumps, because we're gonna put a return pump on each belly tank and uh, six float switch assemblies. And all that added up to $105,000 you know, plus a, a bunch of ship loose instrumentation and stuff, $105,000 to add uh, resistance heating to that system, to, to convert that into a thermal pump system would have been an additional $20,000. So 
the addition of electric heating to a duplex pump set is not super expensive. Right. And, and if I could take a second, just talk about, um, you know, that type of setup versus a traditional centralized setup. As I mentioned before, we see a lot of tendency for engineers to select a setup where, um, you know, you have these large storage tanks at the generator or directly underneath the generator. That setup works really well when everything is going great um, because not you don't have the additional cost of transfer pumps and additional tanks and all this other stuff. Um, but the problems come in when things are not good, whether it's uh, the need to filter the fuel, polish the fuel, whether it's um, you know, cold or hot fuel considerations or even engine problems. Because in a traditional system, while you do have the additional transfer pumps and all those piping considerations, everything like that, you also have a system that's designed to circulate within itself. Um, and just being able to circulate the fuel uh, back to more thermally stable storage uh, underground or something else, that's a massive advantage uh, for these types of systems. And we've seen even cases where um, if you all your fuel is local to each generator, um, if you lose an engine, your redundancy or total hours runtime calculations may be different now because that fuel isn't available for any other part of the system. Whereas with a centralized system, you can pump that back to the main tank, polish it, uh, bring it up to temperature and send it wherever you need it to go. I think in the uh, in the inquiry I was talking about, they were trying to add uh, add more runtime hours by by adding main tanks. Okay, so another uh, another source of oil, oil heating that's often overlooked is the diesel engine itself. Um, I had the slide earlier that showed the little fuel pump on the engine. That pump uh, runs three to four times as much fuel as the engine consumes. So it returns two to three times as much fuel as the engine consumes at a temperature that's 10 to 15 degrees above the fuel supply temperature. So what that means is once you get a generator running, especially if it's running under a pretty good load, the oil coming back from the engine to the day tank is gonna be pretty warm. So once that engine gets going, it can keep its own day tank warm. And then if you have a return pump on the day tank, that warm oil in that day tank can be used to circulate warm oil throughout the whole system and back to the main storage tank. One uh, point on there, and it's something that we've run into on hot fuel issues, um, where there tends to be more of an issue when you're doing uh, periodic testing and things like that. Something to keep in mind with that ratio of return fuel is that if your actual building load or process load is closer to the capacity of the generator um, and you're not testing it on a load bank or on building load, that amount of warm fuel return can be significantly lower because that's a constant um, constant flow rate for most uh, most of these onboard pumps, constant flow rate pumps. So if you're talking, uh, you know, you're returning say twice the amount of fuel back to that day tank under normal testing, but you have a cold snap and you actually have to put the building on load, it may be half of that or less being returned. So it's just something to keep in mind. Yeah, and in the south, you know, we're usually we're usually battling hot oil, not not cold oil. So our systems are really designed more more to keep the oil cool than they are to keep it hot. But uh, one of the nice advantages of the thermal pump uh, that we talked about on the last slide is if it's not cold outside, the thermal pump just never comes on, and it doesn't use any electricity, and it's like it's it's not even there. Right. We have a few more questions. Um, I don't know if you want to take those now or... Uh, yeah, if they're kind of on this topic, let's take them now before we move on. So one of them is uh, along the lines of what we're talking about uh, with designing from the start with cold weather. Um, how would you go about designing a system? Would you take into account the temperature and viscosity um, for that colder temperature or would we uh, just design to have uh, heating in place from the start? And I would tend to lean towards, if I know that uh, we're in New England here, this the case the question is asked regarding New Jersey, um, I would certainly lean towards uh, just designing the system, have insulation and heating that's going to bring it up to temperature and just work off of actual uh, viscosities at spec temperature. Um, you know, understanding that our our pumps, you know, especially if we're talking discharge pressure, our pumps have a lot of cushion for most applications. They're positive displacement pumps. They're going to be able to push downstream. Most of the problems are going to come on the suction side. And so if we're seeing higher pressure drops, uh, it's definitely something we want to take into account 
but at that point, it wouldn't be so much a calculation to see what the actual value is. It would be steps taken to mitigate that. Now, where you are, David, um, there's a lot of systems where um, they weren't necessarily designed from the start to handle cold temperatures. Did you see a lot of issues due to different viscosities? Um, did you see any actual gelling where uh, pressure drops increased, you had pumps cavitating, things like that? The tech support calls I got during the cold front uh, weren't viscosity related. They were they were pore point related. The the pumps would not move oil at all. Oh because wow! Because the oil so was gelled. In discharge side uh, restriction. Yeah, I talked to a few customers that, that would have wished they had viscosity problems because they couldn't move oil at all. So they were just, and, and I think about the way we design our transfer pump sets is that if we're not getting a certain amount of flow, we just shut down. So if, if viscosity you know, gets above a certain level, we're just not even gonna run at all. We're not gonna run at a lower rate. It's, it's kind of a go or no-go situation. Yeah, if you don't make that flow switch, we trip the pumps. Right. Um, and then uh, we have another uh, person here saying that they experienced issues with interstitial leak detectors um, in Texas. Now, David, I think you're somewhat familiar with this phenomenon. I think I know who is asking this question. And we ended up, they ended up having one bad leak detector. I think they've already bought a replacement. But I don't know that I don't know that we know exactly what went on at their facility. Uh, they had outdoor day tanks. Well, they had outdoor everything, but they had outdoor day tanks that had four inches of snow on them, and their pumps were tripped, and they couldn't get pumps to run even in hand. And if you look at the wiring schematic, there's only a couple of things that'll keep a pump and a preferred system from running in hand. And one of them is the uh, the interstitial leak detectors. And their interstitial leak detectors were float switches, uh, PLS-1s. And they uh, they temporarily jumpered those uh, those float leak detectors, and then their, their pumps were able to run. And uh, they ran them in hand, and then they got them to run in automatic too, so the pumps were working fine. They pulled one of the PLS-1s and actuated the float up and down and saw the contacts open and close and saw that digital input uh, go hot and cold in the controller. So in air, the uh, the PLS-1 worked fine. When they put it back in the hole, uh, it started to show a leak again. And what we suspected was that uh, as that day tank got warm, uh, it was melting some of the snow on top of the day tank and somehow snow was, was water was running into their interstitial but they they said that the interstitial was dry, and when they pulled the PLS switch out, it was dry. Hmm. So I don't think I can explain exactly what went on. Now, since then, they did find they had a bad float, but um, during the cold front, we had to jumper three floats at least on, on two day tanks. They, they each, each day tank had two floats for leak detection. And they weren't wired in series, they were parallel? They were wired in series. So um, yep. um, they actually had a pretty good technician uh, who was who was trying to figure the system out, and he, he had a, a multimeter, and he went point to point through the system. Uh, we do it kind of like a limit string on a boiler, and we were able to determine which which floats were reporting a leak and jumper them. and And I wrote down in my notes for that day. He did. He did four leak detectors on two day tanks while he had me on the phone, and three of the four day leak detectors were were showing a leak. So wow. they found one one bad one that was replaced, but I don't think we have a good explanation for the other what happened with the other two. Okay, yeah, I'd be interested to see if any anything new comes out of that. Um, so what would your recommendation be? I mean, you're you're more familiar with that uh, location than I am with these external day tanks. Um, what would your recommend, recommendation be for retrofit on this? I mean, my thoughts would be taking a look at uh, insulating and then probably something along the lines of a thermal pump, but uh, do you have any specific details on this site? This site does not have a central duplex um, pump set. They don't have a headered system. They have three individual day tanks and each day tank has a pair of suction pumps and a pair of return pumps. So what I would do with their system is I would add 
I would add electric heating to their polisher. Ah. And that'll keep the oil warm in their main tank. And then we can exercise the, uh, you know, we can run supply pumps and run return pumps to get that warm oil through the whole system. So using the polisher is, is a standalone circulation device. Yeah, and uh, and I would I would probably insulate their lines too. I, I would insulate their supply and return lines because that's that's quick and inexpensive. Right, right, absolutely. Um, let me just go through the questions here. Uh, there's a question that we have regarding underground uh, storage tanks with uh, concrete interstitial. Um, I should probably clarify. So for underground tanks. It, we we make a distinction between uh, underground, whether it's actually direct buried or whether it is um, below grade indoors or vaulted. So for below grade indoors within the building envelope or in a vault, uh, that's going to be typically a standard UL-142 design, uh, the same as we would have above ground. If we're talking direct burial, uh, we don't see uh, tanks with the concrete in the interstitial cavity. Um, that's going to be more for an above ground tank. Uh, typically, if it's above ground outside the building envelope, it's going to be for uh, impact protection uh, rather than having bollards. And then if it's indoors, it's usually for fire rating uh, required by the local fire department. Um, but the question here is, does the weight of the concrete in the interstitial cavity alleviate the need for a large concrete ballast to prevent buoyancy? Now, since this typically won't be used um, as a direct buried tank, this actually does come into play if it's inside uh, or outside for that matter. Um, and we're seeing a lot more uh, scrutiny of systems that have tanks that are not tied down well or not anchored well. Um, and I don't know if you remember this, David, from uh, Hurricane Sandy, where you, some of these videos that we would see in mechanical rooms where a tank would just go buoyant and start smashing everything inside the room, uh, eventually getting the security camera. And so um, here in the Boston area, we saw a lot of facilities take a second look at you know, even if this tank is full, that oil is lighter than water. So it can uh, it can affect the calculation for buoyancy, um, even in an above ground tank uh, that's being used in an indoor application. So definitely would affect that. Okay, the third point we talked about uh, for winterizing your fuel system is is getting rid of the water. And that, that too is a problem already solved. Uh, this is this is a page out of Preferred's catalog. We make our PF series of automatic filtration sets. Uh, from left to right, they consist of uh, a strainer in this picture to get the large chunks out of the fuel to to protect the motor. It's got its own uh, it's got its own circulating pump and motor, and then downstream of that it goes to a a final filtration element with a coalescing uh, filter in there, and uh, we put pressure switches around the upstream and downstream filters so that uh, you can tell if one of your filters is clogged. There's a um, there's a float switch in the water canister to tell you when that, that canister is full so you can pump out the water. And then this runs on a, uh, on a seven day timer so you can have it run just uh, however many hours as, as often as you want. And we can uh, we can filter down to two microns. Um, I think our normal is is five microns, and the coalescing filter removes 99.9 percent .9 of the water. And these are available uh, from 180 gallons per hour up to 1,200 gallons per hour. Um, we put a we put a little enclosure heater in here too to keep the uh, the water in that filter from freezing but we can add resistance heat to a filtration system like this too, so that you both filter, dewater, and keep your fuel warm. You know, the three things you need for cold weather fuel system performance. This is actually the same sort of a system, but uh, this has uh, chemical injection as well, where we can continuously inject an additive from a, uh, from a tank and then uh, this has a little pump that pumps the water out of the filter to a much larger uh, holding tank so that you can run uh, longer duration uh, wetter conditions without having to, to pump the water out as often. I think, you know, this is a really big consideration. I, I've seen uh, filtration systems about the size of a briefcase on several thousand gallons of fuel. And I have to ask myself, what percent water entrainment is going to cause um, that system to trip out? Uh, and 
when we're talking about a system like this, I know the alternative, uh, a lot of people see the alternative as like a, um, a company that can come in and they have a big truck that can turn the tank over in a few hours, that sort of thing. But keep in mind for a lot of the uh, consulting engineers that we're talking to on this presentation, as far as what you can control at the design phase, you can control what equipment is specified. You can control, you know, what sort of dewatering and filtration is installed, but you can't control necessarily what procedures the person is going to do 10 years from now. So for the longevity of the system, you know, having a standalone system like this on site um, goes a long way. And the other point I'd like to bring up is that once in a while we'll get requests to do a combination transfer pump set and filtration unit. And while I think it's a, a great idea to have um, the uh, polishing or filtration unit have a heater and use that as recirculation, um, one of the drawbacks of trying to combine that with the transfer pump is that we just don't want anything in this that would normally trip out like a high filter DP tripping out on transfer when a generator is actually calling for fuel. Uh, one of the advantages of having the generator tank, uh, the standalone day tank is that even if we send a bit of water downstream, it has another chance to settle out in that second tank um, as well as particulate and things like that. We wanna keep that engine running. So we don't necessarily wanna combine this with the transfer equipment and then have to shut down the transfer equipment on high DP across a five micron strainer. Yeah, and another reason for not combining filtration and transfer pumps is that uh, we want the suction line for the filtration to go all the way to the bottom of the tank. So it'll go to the bottom of the tank and have a T, or it'll go to the bottom of the tank and be cut at a 45 because that's where the water and where the gunk is. So we want the filtration system to have access to to where the dirtiest fuel is at the bottom of the tank. The suction line for your transfer pumps usually uh, terminates six to eight inches from the bottom of the tank where there's less likely to be water. And if you have a filtration system, uh, you should have no water in no sludge in your tank. Exactly. Alex, have you ever heard of somebody uh, getting a bad fuel, you know, having generators shut down because of bad fuel with one of these filtration systems on it? With a filtration system in place that had been running? Yeah, like a PF series filtration system? No, uh, I mean, I have had cases where uh, they had a filtration system there, and it kind of goes back to the point I was mentioning about sizing correctly. And it it had such a small water reservoir that they'd run it for 10 minutes and it'd go into alarm, and they weren't sure how to dispose of the water. And so facilities like that, yeah, it's left off for 10 years and, and they do run into issues. But a properly sized and maintained system, I have not heard of a, a, a system shutting down on fuel quality because of that. Yeah. Um, I haven't either. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, so uh, the last thing to talk about, and this is this is an emergency measure. And Alex, your question from New Jersey might might have had to do with this. Um, in some parts of the country, you can get winter blend fuels, and the winter blend fuel is going to have a much lower cloud point than than a normal winter blend fuel. And nowadays, a winter blend fuel is going to mix number two ultra low sulfur diesel with number one ultra low sulfur diesel or kerosene to reduce the cloud point. And uh, winter blends can reduce the cloud point a lot. Um, we got an inquiry from Antarctica a couple of years ago. They're they're in the process of rebuilding the McMurdo Station down there. You know, the U.S. has the biggest uh, research facility in Antarctica, and they're they're in the process of rebuilding it. And I saw an RFP for a, a pump set for this new building, and it it didn't mention any heaters. So uh, the the inquiry came from kind of a, a commercial agent. So I, I asked them to, I, I sent them a question to, to try and get to an engineer saying, you know, we install heaters in virtually all of our systems in places like Minnesota and Maine. You would think there'd be a heater in Antarctica. And I got a response from an engineer that says, no, we burn a special Arctic blend that's good to minus 40 degree F and we don't heat any of our fuel. So there you go. Um, Arctic blends are available to cover just about any place in the United States. I would uh, say, I don't want to speak out of turn here because I do not personally have a lot of experience with Arctic blends, as cold as Northern Maine gets, but I would think that's got to affect run times and performance and things like that. It's something to have that low of a cloud point and a gel point. Um, I would think there'd have to be considerations taken. I, I'd be very hesitant to, to run that straight through a, an existing system. 
but our uh, winter blends are, are common where you're at in the Northeast, right? Yeah, although um, on the slide here we have uh, uh, warm regions can can actually run into some complications there, and and we had spoken with a fuel vendor down in Texas that had mentioned some differences there. Yeah, I actually spoke to a guy named Clay Gilmer. He's at Reader Distributors in Fort Worth. Uh, he says most places do not offer a winter blend in Texas. And when I was researching this presentation, I called uh, I called two local fuel distributors that I just found on Google. The first two I called did not offer any kind of a winter blend fuel at all. Um, I talked to Reader Distributors. They don't offer a true winter blend, but they do blend in additives into their fuel from November to March uh, that lower the cloud point. So you can get fuel with additives uh, in the DFW area, but a true winter blend doesn't seem to be available here. The refiners don't like to make it because it's kind of a specialty and the, uh, the distributors don't like to have it because it, it has to be stored in, a, in its own separate tanks and, it, and go on its own separate trucks. So nobody's real, nobody's real fond of carrying it, and, and a true winter blend doesn't seem to be available in, in DFW. But you can get uh, fuel with anti-gelling agents in it to lower the cloud point. Yeah, and if I could just take this opportunity to talk about additives. Um, you know, a lot of the, it, it's hard to be real specific. Oh, we, and we have a nice example here. It's hard to be real specific about additives because there are so many different kinds. Um, some of the ones that are uh, touted as lowering the cloud point, which, you know, keeping your filters operational. Um, as we mentioned before, they're, they're probably not going to do much about the water content, uh, but also a lot, some of them just change the shape and size of the wax that's dropping out. So it really is dependent on um, the, the type of filter that you have. Um, also, uh, there are uh, things that we can add that are like water dispersants and things like that to try to break up some of these issues. But keeping in mind that um, if you have coalescing filters, uh, those can actually kind of work at odds with each other. And depending on your system, uh, there's really no one size fits all that you want to necessarily just dump into your tank because some systems, it actually makes sense to keep the water uh, you know, at the bottom of the main tank because your drop tubes are sized correctly. If you were to put a water dispersant in there, now you're carrying more over and you actually get more freezing in your filters. Um, so not to say that all additives are bad necessarily, but I think it's not the universal uh, panacea that some people see them as. Um, we've had cases here in the Northeast where uh, you know, somebody will add uh, in a pinch, you know, they'll add a bunch of methanol or something to a tank to uh, to free up the fuel. But um, some of these additives are, you know, they'll start pulling water out of the system and then they can re-separate out of the fuel uh, in the tank or in the piping. A um, lot of different things that can happen and, and relying on a special additive or relying on a certain blend for the system to operate, um, you know, that, that can put you in a, a tough position. Um, and so, like we talked about before, with having uh, the equipment designed from the start, you can't necessarily control what kind of fuel is going to be delivered in five years um, if you're designing a system, but you can control how the system is designed from the beginning. So just a, just a word of caution maybe on some of these things that are added to fuel. Okay, but the great thing about an additive is if you are, if your system is totally unprepared for unusually cold weather, an anti-gelling agent can help. Yes. And it can be done right now. Right. Um, bear in mind, um, you're going to need a lot. Um, we sell we sell a couple of different additives um, in pints, quarts, gallons, and 55 gallon drums. And depending on the type, uh, one pint will one pint will serve 275 gallons. Uh, there was one where a quart would serve uh, 275 gallons. So read the label, and uh, you may have to be prepared to buy quite a bit of this stuff if you've got a large, you know, a, a large normal size tank for one of our customers. Absolutely. Um, okay, and then we teased that we were going to talk about boiler operations a little bit at the end. Um, do we have any questions on the chat? that are more specific to generators before I move on uh, to a couple of slides about boilers? We have a couple of questions here. Um, 
one of them is, are you seeing more call for fuel heaters since the ultra low sulfur diesel requirement? And I would say that ultra low sulfur diesel has affected so many things. Um, as far as the actual issues due to uh, cold weather, I would say that's it, it has affected that, but it maybe isn't the biggest effect. Um, in my experience, the biggest effect has actually been on just overall fuel quality and uh, system reliability from sludge growth and water entrainment and things like that. Um, the sulfur content, and I know a lot of people that are familiar with fuels will, will already know this, but the sulfur content went a long way uh, to providing lubricity to system components and to acting as a biocide to really knock down a lot of these problems that people are having. Um, and here in New England, it's been a combination of lower consumption. So you have facilities that uh, historically have burned liquid fuels for heat are now just burning them for backup power uh, and lower sulfur content that a lot of systems that kind of got away without fuel oil quality considerations for a long time are now facing new problems that they haven't before. Um, There's no doubt ultra low sulfur diesel has made everything worse as far as oil storage goes. And the, the wax dropout uh, effect that uh, we started to see in 2007 is, is somewhat unique to ultra low sulfur diesel. And also, you know, going back to our very first Rudolph diesel slide, um, ultra low sulfur diesel can contain up to 5% biodiesel. And biodiesel um, attracts much more water than normal diesel. And uh, it's just more likely for ultra low sulfur diesel to have uh, more water in it than old low sulfur diesel. And it, it's such a big thing that even here in Texas, they will lower the amount of biodiesel in ultra low sulfur diesel in uh, in the winter time because it's so bad for the fuel in the winter. So um, the combination of ultra low sulfur diesel with the biodiesel in it is, has certainly made things worse. I agree. Um, and we have a follow-up question here, a couple of them that are along the same lines. Um, so if we have a system in place to dewater uh, our fuel, um, as far as disposal and, and automatic operation of that, um, we do offer on our larger skids the option for automatically removing that from the, the filter stage uh, with a solenoid valve and, and sending that to a holding tank. But then beyond that, as far as disposal, um, this may also be somewhat a regional thing, although I'm sure the EPA has thoughts on this. This is not something we can necessarily just run down the drain. Uh, my understanding is that we need to dispose of this as a, as a hazmat situation. I'm glad you knew the answer to that question. <laughs> Definitely, any anybody on the presentation, please do not put this down your drain, um, or at least don't let anybody find out. Okay, so moving on to boilers. Um, a lot of boiler plants are on interruptible gas service, and they have to fire oil during cold weather. And the the call went out on a Friday afternoon here in DFW that uh, people on interruptible gas service had to be on oil by noon Saturday. So me and 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 virtually all of the uh, the full-time boiler service technicians in the DFW area were running from job site to job site getting people getting people up on oil. And uh, and a lot of people had trouble because they they just don't fire oil regularly. So uh, what you need to do to make sure that you can fire oil when uh, when you have to is to practice. And uh, we had a question come in from a VA hospital, and, and really the VA hospitals do this right. Uh, VA hospitals are required to fire oil for eight hours once per month. And uh, the, smart, the smart VA hospitals will, will run that eight hours on different shifts and different boilers to make sure that, that all the boilers are ready to run on oil and that all their personnel know how to fire on oil. And that's, that's a smart way to do it. And, Eight hours once a month might be might be overkill, but a few hours every quarter is is certainly not overkill. And uh, not only does it make sure that that your oil system is working, but it also will turn over some oil so that if uh, if you fire gas all the time, that uh, you are consuming a little bit of oil uh, when you do these tests, so that you can get a new oil delivery and, and freshen up your oil. Make sure when you get a boiler tune-up that you include oil firing and, and ask for the setting data. 
Um, that way, you know your boiler is ready to go on oil. When you when you hire a contractor in to come do a tune up, uh, don't just tune up on gas. Ask them to look at oil as well. Um, every every boiler technician you're gonna you're gonna hire, um, I can't think of any that that aren't qualified to do oil as well. So it's certainly something they can do. And during that tune up, you'll you'll burn a little bit of oil. And then bear in mind that with modern control systems, when you replace a servo or you replace a control chassis, sometimes you have to re-verify oil, which means you have to go uh, fire oil and hit all those points and confirm that that combustion is, is safe. So if you have to replace a servo, um, make sure that when they retune the boiler, if it has to be retuned on oil, make sure that gets done. Um, Another thing we found out is that oil safety shutoff valves, um, even the expensive premium ones, uh, will sometimes stick if they're not exercised. Um, and this is especially true in cold weather, because what happens is um, some of the stickier components in the oil, um, if the if the valve isn't exercised, they can stick to the gates in these in these gate valves, and uh, and and keep the uh, the valve from opening. So at, at one plant I worked at in February, um, the first boiler we tried to light off, only one of their oil safety shutoff valves opened, and 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 it takes two, right? Because they're in they're in series, so it takes two. So uh, we secured that boiler, and went on to the second boiler. The second boiler did the same thing, and I thought, oh no, this is going to get really ugly. Um, fortunately, I think the third time we tried to light off that boiler, that valve opened, and and just as soon as that oil valve opened, whoosh, we got a nice light off on oil, and I was able to to tune that boiler, check combustion all the way up to high fire, and they had one boiler that was good to go, and I I instructed the plant personnel to take the uh, the stuck safety shutoff valve out of the other boiler, and um, you know, hook it up to a suicide cord and exercise it and run some WD-40 through it and uh, and clean off that gate service, surface. Because there probably wasn't anything wrong with the valve. It, it was probably just stuck with uh, with sticky with sticky stuff on the gate. We've definitely seen that on gas. It's probably the same thing going on your uh, on the oil safety shutoff valve as well. And then um, you can request uh, prevent a maintenance service on your fuel system too. Uh, we do this all the time in the Northeast, where we'll send a technician out to, they they run your pumps, they check all the safeties, they check all the float switches, they check all the leak detectors, uh, they'll they'll stick your tank and make sure that your tank gauge is, is reading correctly, um, they make sure all your leak detectors are working. Um, Alex, you do these all the time, am I missing anything? Well, I think you're not missing anything as far as what we do, um, but I would like to say a word about uh, why this is important because I think the fuel system kind of sometimes gets overlooked, um, especially when we're talking about uh, backup power for generators. And I work with a lot of great generator maintenance companies um, out there, Weld Power, GAFTEC here locally, really good guys um, that you know care about their customers. But you cannot rely on your generator maintenance person to tell you that there's a problem on your fuel oil system. Um, we've had situations where there's a red light on on the panel and nobody realizes it for a year. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of times somebody will have the generator rep or a service company come out there and they're performing all the oil changes and battery swap outs and all that good stuff. Um, but they're just not invested in the fuel side of the system. And if your fuel's bad, it doesn't matter if your batteries are good. Um, so definitely uh, want to keep a specific eye on that. You know, another plug for the Veterans Administration, too, is they always specify uh, fuel polishers for their fuel systems, uh, whether they're for boilers or generators or both. Yeah, that's that, that goes a long way, definitely. Um, David, we have a question uh, regarding uh, fuel considerations for hot fuel. Um, do you want to just take a moment and talk about that? Sure. Um, we mentioned in the in the PNIDs uh, that uh, the pumps on the generators run about three to four times as much oil as the generator consumes, and that oil comes back to the day tank warmer. 
So um, in hot climates, with above ground tanks especially, uh, you've got to take some steps to, to cool off that oil. And, and one of the best things you can do is specify an engine oil cooler on the generator itself. And that's just, uh, I mean, it works like the oil cooler in your, in your diesel truck or, or like my Suburban, where it just blows, it blows ambient air over some coils to cool off the oil before it goes back to the day tank. And that helps a lot. And that's, uh, that's all kind of self-contained in the generator. We can, uh, what we like to do is we'll put a thermocouple in the day tank uh, to keep, keep an eye on the day tank temperature. And if the day tank temperature gets above set point, uh, we do what we call level bouncing, where we'll activate a return pump and pump that hot oil back to the main storage tank. And uh, eventually we'll, we'll hit the pump on switch and then the oil will be topped off with cooler oil from the main storage tank. And this, uh, it, it's something that's built into the control system. So the only additional cost is a thermocouple, which isn't a whole lot. And um, especially when used in conjunction with an underground storage tank, uh, it'll, it'll keep the day tanks cool. Yeah, I really, I really like that option because the, the return pump uh, being part of the system offers so many advantages other than just the fuel itself. Um, it, it's a real advantage from a testing perspective as well. Um, Alex, then, do you see level level bouncing in the Northeast? Uh, like short cycling? Yeah. Well, I mean, do you do you take these these steps to cool off the oil in the Northeast? Yeah, we. It's something. Um, obviously, uh, environmental hot oil has not been an issue, but we are seeing um, the newer generators. I, I can think of one job where it was the same exact model, uh, same manufacturer, same rating, everything popped into the same legacy system and suddenly they had problems with, with warm fuel. Um, part of it is uh, being mitigated by the fact that in Boston, we're allowed to use day tanks that are sized reasonably now. So it's not quite as much of an issue, but keep in mind, if this does pop up as an issue, it's not just a performance issue. That generator can shut down on high, high inlet temperature and, and you're just offline. Um, so uh, it definitely is an issue. One of the other things we've run into is um, we've seen from a retrofit uh, perspective, a couple of things being done. Number one, we've seen it where um, they have used a, a radiator just on the return line from the generator. And we've seen some issues with uh, head pressure on the onboard pump. Um, so something to keep in mind if you're looking to retrofit this directly into the existing piping. The other thing that we've seen is we've seen um, return lines from the generator run back to the main tank rather than directly back to the local day tank. And you just have to understand that now you're, you're essentially derating your system because your, your net consumption is now the flow rate of that onboard pump, not the burn rate of the generator. So um, it's definitely so that's stuff- fine, but your transfer pumps just have to be designed to keep up with it. Yeah, and so it means that you essentially, for it to be fine, you have to have a system that was probably over-designed from the beginning uh, in order to accommodate that, especially if you have multiple generators. So it, it can definitely um, it can definitely pose a lot of challenges, but it's something that we look at on a case by case basis. Um, we also have another question here. Um, do you see suggested design uh, specification for alarms to the billing automation system? And I would say, David, that this is something that that we um, do a pretty good job at as far as controls integration. I know historically you saw things like um, uh, you know, dry contacts, a common alarm out, uh, you know, people wiring a light bulb directly to a, a relay out or something like that. But with the controls that we're um, recommending and, and that are being specified uh, recently, it's really kind of brought the industry into uh, the present day um, as far as Modbus, BACnet, whatever protocol they're talking. And we make everything available to the building automation system as a read-only point um, and if they need graphics, we can do that too. Is that correct? I see that as a requirement on almost every job nowadays. The building automation system wants to be able to see what's going on with the fuel system now. Right, right. And more than just a trouble alarm. Um, but we do provide those as read only so that if there is something that needs to be manually reset at the pump set, we still require the operator to, to physically go to the pump set itself. Most times when it's when it's a brand new project that goes through a design consulting engineer, 
they're going to specify, you know, an Ethernet or a BACnet interface to the fuel system. But in actuality, the only points they're really looking for most of the time are are high-level alarms. They want to know when pumps are running, and what, and they want to know um, if they have a leak. So right. it's the kind of thing we could have done with a few dry contacts, but we're just doing it digitally now. And I think part of that is just the expectation of facilities based on what the equipment was that's being replaced or or what they're used to with legacy systems. Um, do you want to just talk briefly about the uh, what else we're doing on the fuel oil side to kind of bring this into the, uh, would it still be the 21st century, as far as um, being able to see things remotely through the cloud and things like that? Yeah, I mean, that's the next natural step is if a, uh, if a customer doesn't have a building automation system, or let's say it's a customer that has facilities located throughout the United States, one easy way to get all those, get visibility of all those systems in one place is the preferred uh, cloud service, where we can put a little, um, a little wireless antenna in your, in your control cabinet with your controller. It sees all the Modbus addresses in your controller, and then talks to a Verizon cellular network through a Verizon VPN and makes all that uh, data available to you on your own private encrypted dashboard. And we can give you a tab for each one of your facilities so that you can see what's going on at, at every one of your facilities. So you might be in charge of all of your company's facilities nationwide and uh, you'll, get, you'll get an email or a text uh, when a leak is detected or when a tank starts to overfill you know, in, in Peoria, Illinois. Or when the you can go, temperature is starting to get, you know, to a certain point where you got to be worried. Sure. Or you can go onto your dashboard then and see what's actually going on in that plant. And it's, uh, the great thing about the system is that it, it doesn't go on the customer's IT network. It's totally separate. It, it goes straight to the Verizon cellular network to, uh, to a VPN. Right. Right. It's a very secure system. Um, and I think, you know, having that sort of visibility, especially when we're talking about problems like this, where uh, there's a lot of moving parts and understanding what the temperature is in your main tank versus the outdoor air temperature. Um, I, I think, you know, whether it's cold fuel or any of these other problems, um, having more information is going to be, in some cases, the first step to taking care of it. And I uh, just want to thank Prisco for asking that question here at the end. There we go. And the most common question we always get is, can I get a copy of this presentation? And the answer to that question is yes. Just um, email Alex and he will send you a copy of today's presentation. Um, if you want to watch a rerun, this is going to be on YouTube, uh, hopefully tomorrow. And uh, we can send you a link on that. Or if you have coworkers or colleagues that missed it and want to see this, uh, it'll be on Preferred Utilities YouTube page, uh, hopefully by tomorrow. We'll do a little bit of uh, post-production to edit out the ums and ahs and stuff, and then it'll be on our on our YouTube page. Yeah, and I'd like to say to everyone listening, um, if you have a system or if you're a design engineer and you're looking at a problem, feel free to give us a call or send us an email at any time. We're, we're more than happy to talk to you about whatever you're working on. And when it comes to designing or retrofitting a fuel system for cold weather, um, Alex has seen it and done it all. So. Uh, He's our expert, and he's the guy we depend on. Thank you for doing this today, Alex. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Michael, any uh, anything we forgot to mention? Uh, no, I think uh, everything sounds good. Just reminding everyone next week or in two weeks, we'll be putting on a renewable fuels webinar. Uh, we're going to talk about how to basically convert your boiler room to becoming uh, renewable, which is something you think might have to happen with solar panels or maybe installing a wind farm. Uh, but no, you can just do it with your, your possibly do it with the burners you have um, and do kind of Burning simply. a renewable fuel. Right. All you got to do okay. is burn a renewable fuel. <laughs> I want to thank everybody for their attention today. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Alex and David. Have a good one.